Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the League of 72, live every single Thursday, 4 p.m. Get it in your diary. We're on week three now. You can go back and watch the other bits and pieces, but you're definitely going to want to stick around for today's show. It's going to be an absolute belter. We've got Gabriel Sutton, who knows everything about League One and League Two. He's going to be joining me a little bit later on. And within that part of the show, we're going to be talking about an 11 of free agents that are still knocking about, still don't have clubs who could offer up some some great options for teams in League One, League Two, and of course the Championship as well. And there are some huge games in the Championship this weekend. We're going to be having a look at the East Midlands derby. I'm going to be chatting to Liam Rossinho. We're talking about Wayne Rooney, talking about that huge game, Derby County against Nottingham Forest this weekend. Uh, but uh, we'll also be talking to a legendary footballer first, but also he's the kit man for Bristol City, Scott Murray, uh, about the seven-side derby, the big game between Bristol City and Cardiff City. But before we get into anything, let's do a couple of things. First of all, make sure you like this stream. Second of all, hit the subscribe button. There's some cracking content on the channel and it's only going to get better. We've got an amazing amount of access this year. So if you love the EFL, you love your tactics, you love your team, join us every single week and make sure you check out all the other bits and pieces that we have with the big interviews that we've got coming up down the road. And it's a really exciting time on the channel. So subscribe to the channel and of course, hit that notification bell as well. Let's get into only in the EFL. Now, this is a bit that we do every single week and I want you guys to send me clips on Twitter. Use the hashtag LO72 when you see some interesting bits and pieces that could only happen in the EFL. So first up... <laughs> We can have a look at uh, this Sunderland owners who are walking around like they, they own the place at the moment. Uh, Kirill Louis Dreyfus, of course, the new owner. Now, this is a, an incredible flex for me because they brought their dogs to the games. Now, they're not, bre I mean, are they breaking the rules? Are they not breaking the rules? Let me know. Also, can you really get angry? Like, you know, if, when you look at it, you see they're incredibly beautiful, adorable little puppies there. So it's, a, it's an interesting flex here. It's clever. But I think you've got to be winning games. Fortunately, they've got nine points from the first four games. So everything's fine. You can bring your puppy to work. But if you start losing games, then that could be a dangerous world to, to be living in. The second bit that I want to show you, only in the AFL, this is great from me. You know, I, I'm going to pat myself on the back here because I'm quite proud of this one. This is from the Blackburn Rovers versus West Brom game. And uh, Alex Mowat scores a goal. But before that, I want to talk about Thomas Kaminsky, the goalkeeper for, for Blackburn. It's right at the start of the game and he, he produces a cardinal sin here. Great save, great save. But he celebrates. Watch this. He celebrates because no one's getting the ball past me today. Not this afternoon. And then Alex Mowat goes and does that. <laughs> I spotted that. I didn't see that anywhere else on Twitter. But Thomas Kaminsky, just, just wait a second. Do you know what I mean? Just wait. Because you never know when Alex Mount's going to score an absolute scream, which, of course, he did there. Sticking with goalkeepers uh, to round up only in the EFL uh, this week. Pontus Dahlberg, uh, Will Brazier, wonderful host last week. He was going going in hard on, on Dahlberg, uh, who's on loan from Watford for having a nightmare against Accrington. But last week, saved a penalty, numerous different saves as well. Look at that. That is world class. And he got them their first point of the season, which they really, really needed. What a save from the penalty as well. So redemption for Dahlberg. Lovely to see. So as I said, guys, if you see anything out there this weekend, make sure you let me know using the hashtag LO72 and we'll give you a shout out next week on the show if you spot something decent. Right, let's get into some of these huge games. Let's kick off with the championship and the seven-side derby. Um, we've got a very special guest, someone who's he's got some history with Cardiff City. Scott Murray joins me right now. Scott Murray played 255 games I've got here. 49 goals. Is that right, Scott? You probably know better than me. That, that must just be league games, I think. <laughs> so just, yeah, just, yeah, we're getting close to the thousand mark, mate. Some, uh, I think, no, I think, I, I, think very... think all, I think altogether that was sorry, a bit sorry, four, just under, four, just under 450. So I think oh, wow, uh, okay. now's right. I'm, I'm going to have a word exactly. with, I'm going to have a word with That's Wikipedia. Massively. And yeah, it's not good enough. Uh, no, no, I'd say, as I said, I've a great, I had a great time here and loved every single minute of it. Absolutely. So much so that you, you, you stuck around. You know, you, you're the kit man for, for Bristol City, which I want to dive into all of that because I'm sure you've got some amazing kind of insights and stories uh, on all of that. Uh, but first of all, let's talk about your history with this game. First of all, for, for someone who I, I wasn't that aware of, of Cardiff and Bristol City being such a huge game, but it really is, isn't it? Yeah, I think um, Bristol in, in Wales is literally next door to each other. I think it's a it's a forty five minute drive. I think just over the 
the Severn Bridge. I think uh, the good thing is now you don't have to pay to go over to Wales, which is handy. I think, um, as I said, exactly. it's and it's it's a very very fiercely contested derby. I think I think the old Ninny and Park and was was always a very hostile place, and it's probably the same as Ashton Gate now. Before it before we got it all done up nicely, I think uh, the old stadiums and it was uh, it was fiercely contested. And as I said, um, it was never a nice place to go in Indian Park. And as I said, um, we, we weren't very well liked over there. Yeah, well, you say that, Scott. There's a couple of reasons why you probably weren't liked there. And, and uh, you say it's a difficult place to go. I I'm not sure you're that bothered, to be honest, because there is an iconic goal, of course, that you scored in this fixture, which we're going to show now. So feel free to, to talk about it. I've got a few questions here as well. Here's your first yeah, so, one. This you put is, someone this on is your the back. first one. Yeah, that's the first one. Yeah. That's Dean Gordon. Who, who'd you put I, on the I, backside I, there? Dean Gordon. That was Dean Gordon. I think they just signed him on loan mm. from Middlesbrough. And I was actually, the day before, I was panicking because obviously he'd come from the Premier League. And as you said, within... And this this second goes literally a minute after, literally sixty seconds after wow. Dean Gordon again. And the keepers are a stinker, look, and and as I said, I've run doing, run down. This the, is the moment, isn't it? Down, Here it comes. The whole <laughs> Bob Bank. I find out it was called the Bob Bank, and it's been all Cardiff, um, the lively ones. And, and this is me trying to catch some money afterwards as well. Look, they're chucking money at me, so I made a few quid wow. that day. That's for sure. <laughs> I bet you did. Well, and I bet you got a few. You made a few quid in uh, in drinks down the, down the years after that for putting. It. I, I think they did not save that. Come on. I know, yeah. And the, the the thing is, he was a Scottish international as well. So <laughs> it says That's it all, me. really. Well, but as I said, I don't know. Then the celebrations probably saved me a few nights out. I think, and as I said, it's uh, it's it's a big derby down here, and and it's it, they're always the games that you always want to win derby games, and and as I said, it's even mm -hmm. taster this year because I think um, Cardiff have got a few. Ex Bristol City lads in their, their ranks as well, and obviously big Aidan Flint, who's oh, who's a top scorer in the league as well. So it's it's going to be good fun. It is, yeah, and and that that iconic moment of you sort of holding your ear to the crowd, which is it's amazing, isn't it? It's it's something that football fans will have both missed the feeling and also gone, oh, oh I forgot about this <laughs> when when the player goes and does that. And that's an like that is an iconic uh, image now, isn't it? You were telling me before we, we came on air that that's. You know that that's a huge flag that's shown in these kind of games, isn't it? Yeah, I think as well. You know, they, 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 it all started by um, I don't know if you remember Andrew Jordan, Joe Jordan's son. I think he played at Bristol City and he was at Cardiff at the time. I think um, we were lining up in the tunnel literally thirty seconds before going out to the pitch, and and um, Jock, as we called him, he's come up to me, goes, "Scotty, listen, if you score today, tap your head," which I didn't know was yes. the infamous Ayatollah. So I think it's it's one of them Cardiff players do it to their own fans. It's brilliant, but I think if uh, an opposing player does Sam it to the Cardiff fans, it, yes, Sam Aman, yeah, he always used to walk mm. around the stadium. And and the funny thing was, in in the tunnel there was a big moose's head, a random moose head in the tunnel. And <laughs> as I said, Jock's come up to me. He said, "Tap my head." So I, when I scored the first goal, I tapped my head in front of the the stand behind the goal, and, and it got a bit lively. And I was thinking, "Oh wow!" <laughs> and as I said, I've scored literally sixty seconds after. So I've decided to tap my head in front of the Bob Bank, which was their head cases stand. Luckily, the good, the good thing about mm. the Bob Bank, it had fencing. So no one could actually get to me. <laughs> well, there was no yeah. fencing. I'm not sure I'd be here now to, to chat about the goals. But as I said, yeah. I did yeah. the Ayatollah. Just the loose thing. change that came through. The, the, the change actually managed to pay for the bridge, bridge for your home. <laughs> Lovely. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about you being a, a kit man then with, the, with this game as well. Because I, that, I find that, what's it like being the other side of it? Because, you know, you are, it's not understated. You are a, an absolute legend with Bristol City. So for you to come and, and take that job, I, th I, I guess it's, I don't know, do you, do you, do you love it? What, what's, what have you learned from being a, a kit man? Do you know what? I, I, I remember getting the phone call from Derek McInnes. He's phoned me up and I was um, I was working at the club in the commercial department at the time. I was still playing part time. I was going to wait until I'm 37. So the legs were probably, I was playing at Bath City. The, the legs were starting to, well, actually, the legs had gone 20 years before. But I think, uh, <laughs> so Dan McKinnis has phoned me up and said, Scotty, listen, the kit man's leaving. He said, you'd be ideal for the job. I think everybody knows you. And um, obviously, I got a little bit of banter about me. So I think um, I've, I've had a little think about it. And then, um, it was, it was an easy decision because, as I said, I was turn, nearly turning 37 and the legs weren't holding up as much as I'd like to. And as I said, it's, it's a job that I could I could probably do for 20, 30 years, I think. And, and you know what? It's it's probably the ideal job for me. I think uh, you can have a laugh and a joke. And, and I know players like to take the mickey at times and 
the good thing is they try and take the mickey out of me, they'll probably get it back twice as bad. So I think, yes. um, you know, the kit man, they've got to be able to look after themselves as well. And as I said, as soon as the, the players see if you're a little pushover, then uh, your uh, kit man career could be in turmoil before it's even started. So I think um, mm. nah, I, 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 tend to, I tend to give out as much as I give get. <laughs> good. Yeah, you keep keep everyone on on their on their feet. Yeah, sure. I think that's what people often talk about when they when they leave the game is that they miss all of that, you know, being in in, uh, in the dressing room. So for you to be that, that's wonderful. I've got two questions before I let you go. So okay. the first one, you can have, get ready for this one. It will of course be a prediction for the game. But the first one I want to ask you is uh, Nigel Pierce, uh, Pearson, Pearson. He's not Dutch. Pearson and the the gilets and the and the short sleeves. Are you okay with that? Have you let him know that this is not practical? How are you finding his style choices? Um, right. Would you tell Nigel the gaffer? I definitely wouldn't. And <laughs> listen, whatever the gaffer wants, he gets off me. Don't worry about it. He's one of the ones that if whatever he asks for, he gets it. So I think, um, no, the gaffer's superb, honestly. And, and um, as I said, it's, it, it's been a breath of fresh air this season. I think uh, we're creating so many chances. And as I said, we're just not taking them at the moment. And I think at the end of last season, it was probably around the other way. We weren't really creating much. So I think the gaffer's been brilliant. The, the players he's brought in, my James Kingy, I think Danny Simpson, they've all fitted in perfectly. So I think um, I said, no, it's, it's, it's been enjoyable and, and the gaffer, he's great fun. And but he, he's one of them you wouldn't want to get in the wrong side of, which up to now I haven't. And um, as I said, um, right now he's a great man. And as I said, I thoroughly enjoy working with him and, and I, I know the players do as well. Yeah, yeah. I think he's, you know, that, that sort of... Um that fatherly figure that's I think it's kind of uh, it feels like it's needed there a little bit I think he just needs that time to, to get it right I guess yeah so that last question obviously it's from that Bristol City point of view um what do you expect from the game and what do you think is going to be important within the game and what's your prediction um as, as it's gonna be a very loud loud stadium that's for sure I think um, both sets of fans don't tend to like each other much so I think uh, do you know what's a typical derby game and I think them playing at home they'll probably feel like their favorites and as I said, um, but we're, we're quite confident. I think um, we get to go there with nothing to lose. I think, which is usually, which is usually a good thing. Even the the games we that are back in the day when I played, we, we were always the underdog playing away at Cardiff. So it's actually quite nice. And and as I said, I'm I'm, I'm quite confident for a, an away win. Okay, away win. I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised. I mean, that, that's fine. And just in case Nigel walks in, I think that's the, the safe thing to say as well. Um, Scott, <laughs> it's been an absolute joy. To, to chat to you um you were you were uh, often an enemy for me in my sort of in my teenage <laughs> years as a bristol city player but it turns out you're all right so uh, it's lovely yeah. to, to meet you and uh, we'll have to get you on again thanks a lot for your time thank you very much for asking me on thank you very much good luck with the game scott so of course there's two teams in this one uh, just a quick word on on cardiff because i think there is this mix between a lot of young managers in the league but then also um you know, the, the elder statesman, you know, you've got lots of Warner, Mick McCarthy, of course, and Nigel Pearson are two of those. And I think the interesting thing is it's the, the average possession for both these teams are, are kind of similar. Um, it's around 44% to 48%. But then Cardiff are only managing 167 accurate passes and Bristol are averaging 251. I think Masengo is a really important player for, for Bristol City. I thought he was great against Swansea last Friday, made three out of three successful dribbles, great on the ball as well, quite combative as well. But with Cardiff City, I think we know what we're, we're going to see. We're going to see a lot of headers, you know, eight goals scored by headers this season. It's absolutely amazing. And it's coming from the centre-backs. And for Bristol City, they've, they've conceded an XG of two so far from set pieces, which is sort of eighth worst which normally you go, okay, that's not maybe too big a deal. But I think for Cardiff, with the way that they're playing, the great delivery from, from Giles as well, who's getting all those those assists. You've got Giles, top of the um, assist uh, table, and then you've got Aidan Flint, top scorer in the league. It's absolutely outrageous what they're doing at the moment. Somehow their XG is actually still lower than West Brom's, which is 3.8. little sat for you there. Um, by the way, on the channel, like I was saying, so much great content. One of those wonderful pieces of content are the top 10 goals between Cardiff City and Bristol City. And look, we showed you a goal from Bristol City. So let's show you just one quickly. This video is on the channel right now after this live stream. Of course, go and watch it. But what a ball there from McCormack through to Chopna, Chopra, sorry, and he drills it in the bottom left-hand corner. Loads of great goals. And again, look, it's such a tasty game. It really, really is. It's going to be an absolute belter. Let's see it again. Look at that pass. Unbelievable stuff. Don't worry about that. Right, so that's on the channel. I oh, know we are going to see it. There it is. And it's back. And it's there. Come on, we've got to see it now. <laughs>
Ah, oh, these things happen. These things happen. It's all good. Let's move on to the East Midlands derby again in the championship. Uh, derby County versus Forest. Now, if you look at the league table, you'd be surprised by this because, you know, Derby in 14th at the moment, Nottingham Forest rock bottom, losing all four games. This could not be bigger. I think within this game, the experience of Derby County, the likes of Jack Yelka and Davies, who have a combined 1,082 senior league appearances between the two of them, is going to be crucial. Derby County have only conceded three goals this season. have only scored three. So they are sort of building it on a possession-based team, but also looking to just to be tight at the back. But it might be the problem this season as a whole that they might struggle to score goals with a few players out. Colin Kazim Richards, Jack Stretton's playing, Bulldog um, struggling with injury at times as well. Um, but they're going to have to deal with the, the squad brilliantly. And it's down to two young coaches that are trying to keep Derby in this division. That's the remit this season for them. And fortunately, uh, earlier today, I was able to chat with Liam Rossini. And, and once again, this entire a video, this entire uh, interview with Liam Rossini is going to be on the channel any minute now. So it might even be on by the time we finish this stream. So again, we talk about all sorts, but we, of course, talk about Wayne Rooney and the relationship between the, the two of them. Uh, here's a little clip of that uh, that interview between me and Liam Rossini where we chat about Wayne Rooney in particular. Uh, let's talk about that that relationship with with Wayne because it sounds like sounds like you're very ambitious uh, as a coach in terms of where you want to go with, with your career and I, I can imagine that sometimes you know some some players that might have been in the the championship could maybe kind of get get beaten down and, and not sort of just sort of reach for the stars a little bit in terms of how you, how you want to play but some of the names that you're talking about there you know Wayne Rooney is one of the greats of the game. So uh, how has it been, um, you know, working very closely to him uh, and getting to know Wayne Rooney, the, the man and manager, yeah. aside from the, the, the player? Because it, it sounds like maybe he would, I would imagine, have high ambitions and, um, and lofty expectations. And is that something you, you've, you've clicked on? Um, yeah, we've completely clicked. It's been pretty amazing because uh, at the time when Philip Cocu left the club, we were kind of put together. Um, obviously, I played against Wayne a lot in, in my own career and seen him from afar and what an outstanding player he was. And it's interesting because the closer that and, and the more time we spend together, the more we're working together every day, not just myself and him, but Justin, Jason Piercy, the goalkeeping coach, we're getting closer and closer. And what's been amazing is how aligned we are in our approach. We're quite different characters, but we believe in the same values. And, and that's something that hopefully we can build on in the future. I love working with Wayne. I think we complement each other really, really well. And I want to maximize um, his knowledge by learning from him. I've learned so much from him in a short space of time. And um, I think we work together quite well as a double act. Um, believe it or not, I'm actually the bad cop and he's the good cop. Um, so right, well, it, that's, that's what just... I wanted to find out. <laughs> I want to say, yeah, so no, you talk well, about Wayne... the characters of the two of you. What's your character and what's his character? Well, Wayne is someone who I don't think has given enough credit in terms of how intelligent he is actually as a person is 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 standard of empathy understanding people which is a huge part of management and understand if the game is on a whole nother level to what people give him credit for um you cannot have the playing career in the different positions that wayne's had without that football intelligence but even more impressive than that when you work with him every day is his understanding of people he can read people really, really well. He knows how to get the best out of individuals. He knows how to give them confidence. And that's a huge part of his qualities that I've learned from him. You know, I'm quite an X's and O's coach. I love the game. I can talk about F any every different philosophy or playing style or anything like that. But what Wayne gives me is a is an understanding of people. And I can help him on the on the training pitch in terms of my qualities as a football coach. And that's why we've worked really, really well. Uh, but that wouldn't work if we didn't have the same values. And our and our principles weren't aligned and our philosophy wasn't aligned. But somehow it it just so happens maybe the stars have aligned that we've got together because we actually do work really, really well as a team and I, I love working with him every single day. Mm. And and as two young coaches as well, is that do you think that's a, a benefit to sort of again not not kind of dampen your your feelings or ideas on things just to allow you both to kind of run free with it a little bit and, and trust your your decision making because again i come back to that identity that you're trying to put together you know the way that you're playing playing out from the back that's you know a lot of people would be wary of doing that um but you, you know is it nice to the fact that you've just been able to kind of run with it like you say been put together yeah, I think that's been the great thing. I think as a coach, if you're not authentic to what you believe in, you're not maximizing your abilities as a coach. 
Um, and, and actually, I, I'm aware that people said when, when myself and Wayne took the job together that we were both very young, very inexperienced, but so was Pep Guardiola when he took over Barcelona. You know, so so what what we have is an empathy in terms of we both finished playing quite young um, and not long ago. So we have a real empathy with players. We know what it's like now to play in a modern game. We know about modern trends and the way the game is going. And for all the pundits that say the game hasn't changed, yeah, there are some parts of the game that haven't changed, but there are some where it is evolving. The game is evolving and changing. And I think to have myself and Wayne with his experience and his career and my experience, um, we're really confident that we can get the best out of this group and, and hopefully move this club forward. What an incredible talker he is. And uh, we also, of course, asked him about this big game uh, because, you know, he played under Chris Hewton. So I was wondering if, if there's any kind of insider knowledge. Here's what he had to say about this huge, huge game this weekend against Nottingham Forest. Uh, let's let's look forward a little bit, not too far. Uh, let's just have a look to to the game at the the weekend, the East Midlands derby. Mm. You know, a huge huge game for for everyone involved. And I think going into it, I think you know a lot of us uh, would have would have thought, well, Forest is this going to be the year that they start to kind of make that push? They've had a real struggle so far. I know you've you know you, you've got a lot of memories, I presume, with with the manager there, Chris Hewton. Um, what's um what do you expect from you know, from this Nottingham Forest side, having been someone who's who's worked with Chris Hewton? Yeah, I expect them to be super organised. I expect every single player to know their jobs and roles within the team because that's what Chris did uh, with myself at Brighton. And that's what he's done wherever he's been, whether that's been Newcastle or Birmingham. Chris is an outstanding manager and an outstanding coach in his own right. And um, it's going to be a really, really difficult game. You know, the start of the season, it's a form table. So if you lose three or four games in a row in January, February, no one speaks about it as much. But because it's the start of the season, a lot of it's made out. A lot is made out of that situation. Um, I know they're trying to recruit players and get players in, um, but the focus for us is to win the game on Saturday. And we are under no illusions whatsoever about what difficult game it's been. You know, we've, we've analysed their games. They've been unfortunate in every game they've played. They've, they haven't lost by more than one goal. So we know it's going to be a game of tight margins. And, and hopefully one we can come out on top of. Yeah. And, and these Derby games, you know, last year, I think they, you know, they just weren't as exciting because of course, it's not we the same. You need the, from, you, for a screen. Yeah. you need the fans in. I can't wait. You know, it's, um, it's something that I'm really, really looking forward to. Um, it's the first time actually, since I've been at the club uh, where we played Forest at home in front of a crowd. Um, so I'm really, really looking forward to it. I think the fans have been outstanding with us so far this season. Um, and we're giving them everything we can. And if they can be the extra man on the pitch for us on, on Saturday, it's going to make a huge difference. And um, But I can't wait. It's going to be a great occasion. And um, yeah, hopefully it's a really, really exciting game between between two good footballing teams. No doubt, no doubt at all in my mind that this is going to be an incredibly tense affair because Forrest has been struggling to score goals. Derby have struggled to score goals as well and when it comes to Chris Hewton of course they made a change not in Forest last season but Chris Hewton needs that time you know he's going to be an organized coach and you know sometimes that might feel like it's a touch boring for want of a better word but I think if you can create that kind of base and maybe just get a victory in a game like today it could really change everything for them but they've got to create more Brennan Johnson massive miss for them in the game against Stoke City where they didn't do really anything at all Philip Zinkenagel I think is one of those players that could be that spark for them you know they only had two shots uh, in the game against Stoke City uh, he's got himself a goal and assist so far th this uh, season but again his average positions against Stoke he was too close to Lyle Taylor and I think maybe Lyle Taylor needs to st stay a little bit um, further up and central and maybe that could help them he can get involved with Jao Carvalho but they've got to start scoring goals if they want to win games it's really as simple as that and, and it could start this weekend uh, we, we want to allow you the top 10 goals for um, Forest and Derby just like we did Bristol City and Cardiff City so there is a goal and I know Forest fans you haven't seen a goal for a while so here's one for you and it was an absolute Peach from Ben Osborne, injury time winner, 2 1 away at Derby back in 2014 15. The commentary on this is wonderful as well, right at the last minute, and he just drills it. That video is also on the channel right now. Quality content again and again and again and again. Amazing stuff. There's some absolute screams there. Stuart Pierce, there's been one or two managers, isn't there, at Forest? I really do think Chris Hewton is the guy that we need to kind of stick with here. But yeah, what a strike from here, Ben Osborne. He's asking him to, through the legs, 
happy days. And poor Derby County. Is that Richard Keogh? I think he's had that moment before late in the game. But uh, let's not get into that for now. Uh, let's have a look at a bit of a roundup of the championship results. If you don't remember them from last season, before we move on to League One and League Two, um, my beloved Queensbrook Rangers came back from 2-2, still unbeaten at the top of the table. It's, it is Fulham and West Brom really starting to sort of take hold now. Two teams that I did want to quickly touch on. Coventry. Coventry into the top four here with a, an injury time win. Absolutely fantastic. They are they're doing really, really well. And they're scoring a lot of goals. Nine points from 12 this season. And the only defeat came at the hands of Barnsley, which was a 1-0 away defeat. But this was from the first game. Uh, McFadzian, of course, scoring in the 90th. Oh, that's, sorry, that's not McFadzian. This is here he is on its way. Um, but the goals that have been late from them, that's been really impressive. It shows the mentality of the team. And then you've got also someone like Callum O'Hare, who's really starting to kind of find his feet in the league. It's a really exciting time, I think, to be a Coventry fan. Now back at their own ground, obviously really important. Callum O'Hare hasn't actually got himself an assist or a goal yet, but the thing that's important with him is creating chances. You know, 2.8 key passes um, is, is really high, especially for a team that's not scoring that many goals, five goals in, in four games. And Giocores as well, who had a tough stint at Swansea, uh, is doing well, doing well. He's scored two and one assist for Coventry so far. So we've got to keep an eye out for them, see if they can keep this going, because we were probably expecting them to be down the bottom, much like Huddersfield, who, are, again, are currently doing OK for themselves. They had a sort of funny start to the season with a draw against Derby um, and then a 5-1 defeat to Fulham. Um, but wins against Preston, uh, who I think will be down there as well. And then this uh, victory at the weekend, Kimura uh, getting a goal to get them going. And it looked like all was lost again, which is what teams down the bottom or a team who you think might be down the bottom, they often concede goals late. But actually it was the opposite. Levi Colwell, I don't know what he's even doing up there. He's the centre-back, of course, on loan from Chelsea. Scored a goal after the equaliser from Billy Sharp. So, Sorba Thomas, another interesting player there for them. Came from Boreham Wood, so you wouldn't expect him to pull up trees. But three man-of-the-match performances from him so far this season. So, another name to keep an eye out, Sorba Thomas. Uh, and if they can win the next one against Reading, then I think they can sort of get that momentum for, for a team that we thought with Carlos Corberan might struggle a little bit this season. Let's see where they are then in the league table. Uh, I think they're about mid-table. Are they mid-table? Yeah, I think they are. Yeah, there they are. Um, doing pretty well for themselves. I think they can be happy with that. Um, Fulham and West Brom start to assert their dominance. And Stoke City, what a cracking start for them as well. And oh, yeah, look, Queen's Park Rangers in fifth, uh, which we're well happy about. Hopefully, we can beat Coventry this weekend. Uh, let's move in to League One um, because... I think, again, we need to sort of take stock of the, the, the game so far. It is just a form table at this moment in time. But if we do have a look at the, the league table, you can see that Sheffield Wednesday and Wickham off to a cracking start. Sheffield Wednesday not conceding many goals at all at the moment. But we're going to kind of look down the bottom of the table here, starting off with Charlton. Um, interesting times for Charlton. And I've got a, a massive pinch of salt with Charlton because I think Charlton fans will start to get a little bit nervous in what is a very difficult League One um, division. But they are conceding a lot of goals at the moment. A lot of um, games where they're conceding two goals. But they are against very difficult teams, I think. Oxford will be, you know, in the top half of the table. MK Dons will be in the top half of the table. You know, Wigan with their latest defeat. Sheffield Wednesday opening game of the season. But the problem for them is scoring goals. Uh, you know, they've only scored twice in their opening two games. These, even this last game, you've got James McLean, who's gone back to Wigan. Both of those goals were quite late on for them in this one. And Wigan will be right up there. We've also had a really tough run, but have been able to get the goals. But you've got to stick with Nigel Adkins there. I think he'll, he'll, he'll find a way. You know, Charlie Kirk, Jaden Stockley, uh, Delang Jacimi, all players that should work well together, but it just doesn't seem to be happening at the moment. And they only create one big chance in that game against Wigan. So they need to, need to sort of arrest that uh, and hopefully they can do that this weekend i think that it's a winnable game this weekend crew alexandra so they got a real chance there moving on to fleetwood town who hadn't won a game yet it was a game of late drama against cheltenham and uh they uh, cheltenham are a very difficult team to, to play against this season i think they'll be absolutely fine um, but for fleetwood they really really needed this simon grayson's uh, men needed uh, to get themselves back into it. And to win a game like this, when it is so tight, it was one where it looked like they, they were there, they were over the line. And then Alfie May scored for Cheltenham 
I think this is him here wheeling away. And it looked like that was going to be it, 87th minute. But Shaden Morris, who's looking like a, a really exciting player for them. I mean, he couldn't miss, could he? But 90th minute winner for the Cod Army. Simon Grayson gets himself um, a, a win, which is so important. So I think, I think Chatham will be fine. But I think we just wanted to touch on Fleetwood there because they've got some, you know, players who should be solid in the division and they should be absolutely fine. And finally... Plymouth fans, you're not going to like this because really this should be glorious. You won 3-0 against Shrewsbury Town. But I'm actually going to say, Shrewsbury, don't get too downhearted about this. Yes, it was a 3-0 defeat. I think the two, the front two for Plymouth are looking like a right pair. They're playing in that 3-5-2. Ryan Lowe seems to trust those two to score the goals for them. But if you look at how the game panned out and how Shrewsbury are getting on this season, they've conceded seven goals, which is joint second most. But the, the XG that they've conceded so far this season is 3.4. So I think if they take a second, even in that game, I think they had 16 shots. Plymouth only had eight. Plymouth only actually created one big chance and still <laughs> scored three goals. So quite a misleading 3-0 for them. And I, I think Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury will, will find their feet uh, once again as well. But like I say, it is so up for grabs. If you think I'm wrong, of course, let me know uh, what you think. Let's have a look at um, at that table once again, just to see where, where Shrewsbury are, uh, if we can do. Should be right at the bottom at the moment uh, this weekend. Fleetwood with that win that gets them out of it. Rotherham, I'm a little bit disappointed in them, I've got to be honest, but they've had some tricky games to start with as well. But it is going to get super, super congested. And a shout out to Accrington Stanley, who lost that first game of the season to Wimbledon and have come back incredibly strong. And Burton Albion as well, doing fantastic stuff in League One. Right, I've got myself another guest, and he, God, he's gorgeous. He's lovely. It's Gabriel Sutton. Gabriel is going to join me now, and we're going to take a look. Hello, Gabriel. Oh, he's blushing. He's blushing. We're going to have a look at an EFL free agent 11. Now, we've put together players who are obviously out of contract. They're available right now because it is the final week of you know, the transfer window. So we put together a 4-4-2, incredibly British. And what I want Gabriel to do is help me along the way and pick a goalkeeper or one of the defenders, a midfielder, and then a striker as we make our way through uh, this list of players that are all available. Go and get them, guys. And all of it, there's some names in here, Gabriel. I'm absolutely amazed haven't been picked up yet. Is this, is this slightly different to other seasons in terms of the amount of free agents that seem to be out there? I think so. Uh, I think there's been some clubs that have been reluctant to make big uh, financial commitments at this stage because of the climate that we've uh, that we've been in recently. Of, of course, it's great to have fans back, but I do think that maybe there is that doubt. Maybe clubs aren't in a position to put push the boat out and and give players the wages that maybe they feel they yet uh, they deserve. So I think that might be why we're seeing a lot of a lot of players without uh, without a club. But hopefully that can be rectified. Mm. That's it. Yeah, we 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 we're expecting. Um, uh, we're going to split it. I think seven seven and a half percent each. Me and Gabriel want a cut from any deals that are done from this eleven. Let's dive into it. We're going to kick off with the goalkeeper and the four defenders here, and I'm going to race through them. It's going to be incredibly hectic, but exciting as well. Um, so just to read them out: Jamal Blackman, Ahmed El Mohamedi, David Wheater, Scott Dan, Neil Taylor. Jamal Blackman, first and foremost. Chelsea goalkeeper who was on loan eight times. He was at Rotherham incredibly recently. Uh, Wickham, yeah. Sheffield Wednesday. He's had. Uh, he's an old-fashioned goalkeeper. I think he'll do well in a, a League One team or a lower championship team. He's played both levels. Um, a team that springs to mind uh, for me, uh, Gabriel, I think Plymouth might work for him. They've only got two senior goalkeepers at the moment. Right back. We're going to go with El Mohamedi. Obviously, this will be for a championship club that's maybe got a bit of money to kind of pop in the wages. There's a few Villa players in this list. Um, 14 appearances and eight starts last season in the Premier League. His last EFL season, he had nine goal contributions, two goals and seven assists. And so this might be one for Scott Murray's Bristol City under Nigel Pearson. They've got Danny Simpson as their right back, 34 himself. So maybe you get both of those in. You've got one who's a bit more of an attacking option in El Mohamedi. And then uh, Danny Simpson, who could, you know, maybe against those teams where you want to sort of shut up shop a little bit more. But it's, it's mad that he's, he's not got a team just yet. The next player is a player that I think is one of your favourites on this list. David Wheater, mm. um, someone who's had, he's had a tricky time last season. But of course, he was playing in the championship as in 2019 you know what you're going to get with him uh, a wealth of experience but he had a, a difficult time i'm just going to read a, 
a quote from him. He said, I've always been a low maintenance professional and loved what I do. But after last season, I'm happy not to do it. I don't think I'll ever say I'm retired, but dot, dot, dot. That was after a, a difficult spell with Oldham where, he, you know, he didn't get anywhere near the, the first team. But do you think there's a player still in here? Just, you know, for I use. think so. I think so, James. Yeah. He, um, what David Wheater's good at is organising the defence around him and heading balls out of the box. Um, he said, I think, in recent interviews that he's looking to stay in the North East. I don't think he's in a situation in, in his personal life, really, where he's looking to, to relocate. So I think Hartlepool United could be uh, an option sure. for him. They've got Gary Liddle there, who's another experienced head. Um, but I think as a rotation option, I think they could do a lot worse than somebody like uh, David Wheater because uh, Dave Chalner, of course, plays a 3-5-2 formation with wide centre-backs. Mm. So that means he won't get caught out in wide areas and can just stick to what he's good at, really. That's an incredible show. Yeah, great show. I was saying someone, another newly promoted team, maybe Sutton might be a, uh, another one where you can add that experience. But that's, yeah, you're right. With that 3-5-2, that's a lovely little fit there. Great show. That's why, we, that's why we've got him on, guys. Stuff like that. Right, we carry on. Another centre-back, Scott Dan. Um, I mean, again... And what a player. I'm amazed he's not even, uh, he's, he's not been snapped up straight away. You know, Tim Cahill vibes here. I think Nottingham Forest could be a really good shout for him. You know, they're a little bit light, mm. Worrell, and so not available at the moment in terms of the centre back. So I think he could be a, a shout for them there. Over to left back, Neil Taylor, another Aston Villa player. He's a player with over 100 appearances in the Premier League. Um, He's also got that sprinkle of, uh, of, of playing in the Europa League. He's been all over the place. And I think the interesting thing with me, a little stat on, not stat really, a uh, new development, I guess he's got his A licence for his coaching. So he could be maybe a, a good option for maybe like a Stoke City. Goes there, is, is a, a good uh, backup uh, for them there, but also someone who maybe wants to get his coaching badges and, and work his way through. We're going to keep going here, Gabriel. Get yourself ready to give us your midfield pick. Here are the midfielders, guys, if you're watching at home. Uh, here they come. Uh, so Nathaniel Mendes Lang, we've got Glenn Whelan, Jack Wilshire, of course, in the news recently, and Robbie Brady as well. Uh, Mendes Lang, I think it's it's interesting. He kind of followed Neil Warnock to Borough, didn't work at all. Uh, he was only there for six months, but we know he can score goals and and offer up some little brilliant little sparks and moments, especially in transitional play. Maybe with counter attacks. My shout for, for this one, maybe Peterborough, 100 appearances for them. So maybe that could be good for both. Um, I think he's mm. certainly good enough for the championship, a lower championship team. Glenn Whelan, uh, currently, currently at Bristol Rovers, uh, Gabriel. I want to get your thoughts on this one. I think this is your pick for the midfielders. Am I right? Yeah, that's correct, James. Uh, I think Glenn Whelan's going to be a very solid midfielder, either at League One level or, or in League Two. Um, he's very destructive, does the simple things really well. I think probably his time in the Championship has maybe passed him by a little bit now, but I still think with his experience, he could certainly do a job in League One or League Two. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. I think, yeah, maybe being that metronome, he's never really had the legs. He's always been the guy who kind of sees it, reads the play and plays mm. it sideways. And so maybe maybe Bristol Rovers could be a good fit with him. Joe Barton needs to get something going there. So maybe he can uh, bring that to them. Someone who's also cracking on the ball, Jack Wilshere. Looks like Wigan are in for him at the moment. The, uh, the owner of Wigan... <laughs> has put out a tweet. We were chatting about it earlier, weren't we, Gabriel? It looks like he's offered him a, a place there. I'd just love to see him, at, uh, maybe like a team like Swansea, where maybe he's not got that physicality, but he would. he's always so comfortable on the ball. And I think he could do a, a, jo a job there. But if he does go to Wigan, that's a packed midfield they'd have. Yeah, absolutely, James. Um, I think this is the thing about Jack Wilshere. Like when he came through, he was perceived as a, a world class talent uh, at Arsenal. Hasn't quite worked out for him, but I think in the EFL, there's every possibility that he can do damage. It's funny you mention Wigan because um, they've had Nick Powell before, and I suppose you might say it's a, not a dissimilar story with him. And, and when he was playing for Wigan a couple of years ago in League One, he sort of was the best player in the league by far. So. So, um, yeah, that, that's an interesting one for me. And I think Wilshere could be a great signing, um, certainly for the championship and even more so for League One. Totally. There's, I mean, there's real Barry Bannon vibes if, if he does go to, to League One because you can play as a six, an eight or a ten. And, and played, you know, mm. didn't play badly at Bournemouth. He wasn't bad at Bournemouth. He, he offered something no. different. On that left-hand side, we've got Robbie Brady. Uh, Robbie Brady, I mean, arguably, still a Premier League player, really. Um, 
And so I think if he goes to a championship team that deep down, he's going to want to play. He's got, but it's got to be the right role for him. So maybe a left wing back role, and maybe West Brom might want him. He's got that energy. I know Connor Townsend has been great. And you, you've got somewhere, you've got some long throws for the, both of those sides of Connor Townsend. And of course, Darlon Furlong on the other side. So maybe, maybe wouldn't start there. So maybe that wouldn't work. But if you brought in someone like Robbie Brady, you've got someone who would be ready for the Premier League. If you do bounce back, which is of course the aim for West Brom. So I think Robbie Bray is probably one of the most talented players on this list. Although we're going to our strikers now and there's there's one hell of a name still to talk about. Uh, let's have a look at our strikers then. Work hard, play hard. Nicky Maynard, there he is. And Daniel Sturridge. Um, let's let's talk about uh, your pick first, which is, uh, of course, Nicky Maynard. Daniel Sturridge shunned again by Gabriel Son. Um, you know, scored that dramatic winner against Forest Green Rovers last year. Was generally was was great for them. Um, I was surprised they didn't retain him. Were you? Is this an age thing or just they were able to get better better options? It's a very interesting one, James. I think we're seeing a, a theme uh, across the game, really, where um, really good goal scorers aren't necessarily uh, in fashion. So, M Nicky Maynard scored lots of goals. I think he was top scorer in League One, in, in League Two, sorry, in the 18 19 campaign. But that was for a very side that played with this really expansive 3 5 2 system under Ryan Lowe, where he was going to create, had loads of chance creating for him. He had a, a really energetic strike partner, and everything just kind of worked for him. Um, I think if there's a team in League Two that has that kind of system, you know that Nicky Maynard, you can just pop him in and he'll score sort of 20 to 30 goals because that's the kind of finisher he is. I think the key is just building a system that, that works for him because I'm not convinced about other areas of his game, but in terms of someone that can just snuff out chances, he's one of the best in the business at this level. Absolutely, yeah. You know, a team that scored a lot of goals last year, somehow is really struggling with it this year. Oldham only scored two league goals this season, which is joint lowest. So maybe that could be an option where you need, you know, yes, you, you've you got to carry him somewhat, but you've got yourself a poacher there. You know, similar to my club, I think Charlie Austin does that a lot of the time. It's so much better when he's got someone with him and it's worth its weight in goal mm. when you've got a goal scorer like that, especially, you know, in, in League Two. So it'd be interesting to see if he can get himself a, a team at, at any point. And finally... Daniel Sturridge. So Daniel Sturridge, who is uh, without a club since leaving Trabzon Sport in 2020, uh, could definitely offer something at championship level. I mean, as shown by that goal, if Danny Ings can do it, Daniel Sturridge can do it. I mean, I, and we want to see that celebration, of course, once again. Um, Daniel Sturridge, of course, will divide opinion. I was listening to a podcast actually with him recently, and he's, you know, he still has real ambition to, to you know, to be to be playing football. You know, he's not a player who's just you know, has forgotten about playing. It's just, he's just had a tough time, a bit like Jack Wilshire. And I think, we, you know, talking about earlier in the show, uh, sorry, in, in my interview with Liam Rossini, which you can see on the channel about Ravel Morrison and just finding a home sometimes. I think the same could be for, for Daniel Sturridge and maybe someone like Blackburn who've lost Adam Armstrong, lost a lot of goals there. Would maybe, maybe Daniel Sturridge might be, uh, uh, be a great reinforcement there because they do feel a little bit light up top. Yeah, quite possibly. Um, I think with uh, with Blackburn Rovers, Adam Armstrong was such uh, a massive influence there. He was such a uh, a big finisher, and they didn't actually have that many goals from from midfield last time out. And you're not quite sure where the goals are going to come from this season. Although they've had a steady start, it's mainly come from sort of pressing and, and transition. So I think having a, a clinical centre forward like Daniel Sturridge, um, I think that would be massive for them. Whether they could afford the wages, uh, I'm not so sure. Yes. Yeah, I guess wages might be the stumbling block, but, you know, it gets to a point, doesn't it, where, you know, beggars can't be choosers for want of a better phrase. And, you know, if he wants to play football, I think going to the championship is a wonderful place to then create a springboard again. And, you know, he's got to go and prove it again. So maybe a championship club would would be good for him. You know, if he does want to play for free, Queen's Park Rangers are available. Um, so, guys, what do you think? Is there anyone that we've missed on this list? Let us know. Um, and who out of these guys would you go for? Um, to, as a pick for your club and tell us the club as well because I'd love to know because it'd be interesting to see how many of these players are snapped up between now and the end of the transfer deadline I guess the, the caveat with all of this is they are free agents so you know they could they could still sign up at, at any moment um, so that's a that's league one and a free agents has got a little smattering of everything let's dive into league two shall we Gabriel because if we have a look at the results from last week um, interesting times here and again 
I think as each game goes by, the picture is being painted. Um, and just from those results, Gabriel, any anything that really, really stood out? I mean, there's, there's certainly the, that Forest Green Rovers, is, is they are really putting a marker down, aren't they? Oh, they absolutely are, James. Um, 6-3, it was uh, what an incredible game. And the amazing thing is, Nicky Cadden scored a hat-trick in that match, and he's a left wing back. And I think I've, I've had a look through this as well i think it's incredibly rare that a wing back scores a hat trick the only examples that i've uh, come up with outside the efl trophy has been um Levin kazawa scoring a hat trick for psg in the champions league once and i believe andy little wow. did it for rangers once but that, it's incredibly rare scenario so well done to Nick, nicky cadden yeah, uh, and well, yeah, I'll go to Rob Edwards as well. Ten goals. The next best is five with, with Rochdale. And and if we have a look at those results just one last time, because there was a game in midweek, of course, um, and Harrogate have, uh, had to have a couple of games um, postponed, problems with, with COVID. Getting a 2-0 victory away at Leighton Orient. We can show you some of the some of the footage from the game uh, now. Um, it was Harrogate's first match after a two-week layoff due to that COVID outbreak. Um, so forgive them for being a little bit rusty. However, they had nothing to worry about. And it's three games now. They've won all three. Went 2-0 up inside 31 minutes. Thanks to a brace from Luke Armstrong, who, who had a cracky game for them, didn't he? A real sort of big man up top for them. They're a, they're a, they're a really... You can trust Harrogate, I, I find, from the, the, the stuff that I've seen about them. They are, you know what you're going to get last season. Well, we didn't know what they, we were going to get last season from, from them, but they really did impress us. And this year, carrying off in, in the exact same vein. Ex exciting times, isn't it? Absolutely, James. And what I love about Harrogate is they've got a really stable squad because they've got a core of players that have been with them for a long time, possibly even going back to their uh, National League North days. Uh, so you can see that there's a real synergy about the group. And I think what uh, what Simon Weaver's done this summer is uh, is just adding little bits, little snippets of quality on top of that. So Luke Armstrong seems to have bulked up since his last stint in the EFL, had a great season the year before at Hartlepool. Um, some really scruffy finishes which i love um you know getting in that six yard box uh so really well yeah. done to him and of course mark oxley the goalkeeper as well has had a fantastic start for them harrogate fans were singing their name his name on on tuesday night so they recruited well and they've got a stable squad i think it bodes well for them yeah yeah, yeah. Warren Burrell had a, a cracking game in that one as well. George Thompson on the right hand side as well. You're right. That's it. That's where the trust comes from, of course, from from an element of stability. I think you're seeing that throughout the divisions. Actually, the teams that haven't had too much movement, um, you know, are carrying off again on the right uh, right foot. And it's it's up for grabs in League Two. It really is. It's going to be mm. interesting to see if they can keep this run going. They do seem incredibly solid. Um, Leighton Orient, on the other hand, of course. They had that unbeaten start to the campaign. That's come to a halt now with a, a home defeat. Um, Kenny Jacket will obviously be disappointed with that. And a, a few a few injuries cropping up as well for them as well. I know Paul Smith's going to be out for quite a while. Um, what, what do Leighton Orient need to do this season to get themselves into that, that top seven? Because it is automatic a little bit too ambitious to, to go for with them, or, or especially with the, the current injuries that are there? Well, I think getting Kenny Jacket was uh, was a big coup for them. I think the the criticism that Jacket had at, at Portsmouth was that um, the style of football he employed was a little bit too direct, and um, I, I think a lot of their fans weren't necessarily entertained all the time. Um, we've seen a slight change for the most part since he uh, came into Leighton Orient, and I think if you look at that performance against Exeter when they uh, they won very comfortably, and it suggested that the approach play won't necessarily always be direct it was more sort of clever passes uh, there seems to be a you know real sense of professionalism about the way Kenny Jacket organizes his side about what he expects from his players uh, I think you there was a slight regression in that performance against Harrogate that Kenny Jacket admitted wasn't quite right so I think bouncing back from that will be really important for the O's and of course uh, recovering from the injury issues that they're facing yeah, so Paul Smith, as I alluded to, you've got Aaron Drinnen as well, the striker. Mm. He's just sort of that swollen ankle injury, so it looks like he's he's gonna he's gonna miss this big game this weekend against Bradford City because I think we're still at that stage where we're kind of figuring out how good these teams are. And Bradford City, though, yeah. have have looked very solid. Andy Cook looking pretty unplayable at, at the moment. Um, there seems to be a different energy with Bradford City this year. Is that you know is that as simple as saying it's down to Derek Adams? I think Derek Adams is is massive. We saw the impact he had at, at Morecambe, who were uh, uh, probably 
uh, a much smaller club at, at this level and um Derek Adams changed the culture at, at Markham and it feels like he's doing this at, at Bradford City as well. He's very focused, he's very driven and um, I think, yeah, just the environment's very different and uh, I think having fans coming back as well is massive for Bradford City. Uh, I think that's mm -hmm. contributed to it. But Andy Cook as well, he um, he was massive in that 4-1 victory over Stevenage the, the previous Tuesday just before they went 3-2 at Mansfield. He's looking like he could be one of the best drags in the division this year. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Absolutely flying at the moment. Great win against uh, Mansfield uh, as well for, for them. Who Mansfield, I think we expect them to be up there as well uh, at some mm. stage. Let's move on to a, a team that really, I mean, everyone was expecting to do far, far better than they, they are. And then a side that I think had a sort of shaky start, kind of an uninspiring um, Exeter City, but they absolutely trounced Bristol Rovers last week. Uh, and uh, both teams, both teams played 3 4 one, two. Both teams had 19 shots in total. Both teams had nine shots on target. A big difference here was the quality of those chances. Um, because Exeter, they created six big chances to Rovers' two. Matt Jay, the captain, scoring two. There was three shots on target. And then you've got someone like Brandon Hanlon for Bristol Rovers, who came on at halftime, got three shots himself, which were on target, yet failed to score. So... I think first things first, I guess Exeter, I kind of want to focus on here, really, because I think we were kind of mm. waiting for them to, to, to have a response from them. There are some huge concerns here with Bristol Rovers with the amount of money that they spent. And you talk about energy. There, is, there isn't a nice energy about Bristol Rovers at the moment. And, and some of those goals, again, were far too easy in terms of pressure on the ball, the ability to, for Exeter to just pass the ball into the penalty box. Quite a scary time. But you want to give Exeter some credit in all of this. And, and they've made a signing this week as well, haven't they? They have, James. They've signed Colin Daniel, who's a left back or left wing back. He's a, a really experienced um, footballer. He's um, played at a higher level, I think, before with Burton Albion and, uh, and Blackpool. And um, the, what's interesting is they play Jake Priest as the left wing back in that game against Bristol Rovers, but he's right footed. So, um, and um, obviously it didn't work too badly, but um, I think having that bit of cover there with, in the absence of Jack Sparks, who's out for a while, I think that's really going to help them. Great to see Matt Jay doing so well in that game against Bristol Rovers. He's kind of a w withdrawn forward I've, I've liked for a while. So really promising for the Grecians, I think. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it needs to, something needs to change quickly for, for Bristol Rovers. I'd love to know in the comments, guys, any Bristol Rovers fans out there, Exeter as well, you know, how do you see, do you see it changing? Will that change come for Bristol Rovers and for Exeter City, 12th in the league at the moment? Do you see yourselves pushing on from here? Because I think, yeah, they're normally there and thereabouts, aren't, aren't they, Gabriel? Let's, uh, let's move on to one team as well. They got the first win of the season, so we wanted to make sure we spoke about them. Uh, Rochdale, with that first win against Northampton, a 3-1 win. Rochdale did brilliantly. Turned the screw after going in at one all at the break. Strikes from Josh Andrews and Abraham Ado, who, uh, from the highlights in particular, I thought he looked like a really exciting player for them. Mm. But prior to that, they'd had a 0-0 draw with Scumthorpe and, and a 3-2 uh, loss to Harrogate, which is probably not looking as bad as you would think now with how well they're playing it but they've they've also built on it with a win in the week a 2-0 two, two win against Shrewsbury in the League Cup there is Ado with that goal cracking finish he looks like a, a real player for them and where, where do you see Rochdale ending up this year? I think they've got to be encouraged by the work Robbie Stockdale has done. It's been uh, quite a turbulent summer for them because, you know, there's been question marks about this uh, questionable um, consortium taking over. They've taken a while to get rid of uh, an unpopular CEO as well. So um, there's been a lot of that hanging on in the background. And I think that's meant that the recruitment has actually been quite late. So they started the season with a pretty wafer thin squad. So all things considered, I think they're in a good position now. Um, I like what I see of, of Robbie Stockdale as well. And I think you're right to bring out, bring up uh, Abraham Ado because he looks really quick, very skillful and produced a really powerful finish as, as we saw there. They obviously got that 3-1 win without their their main striker, Jake Beasley. They loaned in um, Andrews, Josh Andrews from Birmingham City and he scored uh, that third goal that you saw there so um mm. so i think promising promising for them and i think if they finish in the top half and have a little bit of stability because they've got a new board that's pretty pretty inexperienced coming through i think stabilization there yeah there are moments when you kind of when you when you're watching all these games and it, it finishes like that from a dough you go oh hang on oh 
sort of takes you back. You go, hang on a minute. Like that's, that doesn't happen that often, a, a strike of that quality. So someone to certainly keep an eye out. And a big game for them this weekend. Um, they take on 13th placed Colchester. So this will be a good good barometer to kind of see where where they are at in, in terms of the other teams. Colchester, sort of very hit and miss so far this season. So it'll be interesting. Let's have a look at that league table then. And uh, just before we have a look at all the fixtures um, this week, is there one team in there, Gabriel, who you're... You're surprised they've done so well or so badly? I think a lot of people are surprised that Hartlepool United have um, are in the top seven at this stage. I think um, when I asked League Two followers for their predictions, I think a lot of people had them going down with, with Scunthorpe because a lot of people were concerned about the 50-day back, day back gap excuse me, between uh, winning the playoff final and starting the season against Crawley. And uh, there's been a few areas that they needed to uh, to address in the market as well. But so, yeah, so I think to, to produce two good home performances in the league, I think speaks uh, speaks volumes for the work that Dave Charlton is doing there. Yes, yeah, generally it seems to he, he seems to be the sort of the I mean, of course, he is the manager, but the star man in all of this, him kind of putting mm. the pieces together to make them hard to beat and also get some points on the on the board early doors because as a newly promoted t- team, you want to get off to a great start. So that is that is good for them. Let's have a look then before we say goodbye at the fixtures and see what are the, the big games going into the, this weekend. Of course, we've touched on several of them, um, but there are, you know, every game's a big game in the AFL, obviously. Um couple in here I think are interesting. Huddersfield Town against Reading, as we, we've kind of alluded to. It'd be interesting to see where they're at. I've got to say, Luton Town, Sheffield United is a really interesting one for me. Luton Town with a, you know, a, a battering against Birmingham City recently. Sheffield United still haven't got that first win. So uh, scary times for them. They really need to sort of get moving now. I think we, I said it myself, the, my predictions, I see Sheffield United struggling initially not really this badly. So I, I, it needs to start somewhere. Maybe it does with an away game against Luton Town, which uh, which isn't an easy one. Let's have a look at League One. League One, Burton Albion, Cheltenham, Rotherham, Doncaster Rovers, another Yorkshire derby there. Cheltenham Athletic against Crewe, as I said. Big one for them. They need to go and get that. Morecambe versus Sheffield Wednesday will be a cracking game for the Morecambe fans at home. Cole Stockton, top of the charts when it comes to the goal scorers at the moment. Akron to Stanley will hope to carry on that good work against MK Dons. Cambridge United as well against Bolton Wanderers, I thought was an interesting one. Two teams obviously promoted from last season. Ipswich Town need to get themselves moving as well pretty quickly. And... Could be a playoff game this season. Sunderland versus Wickham Wanderers. Wickham going off to a flyer. Sam Vokes doing really well. And I've got a real soft spot for Wickham. So I could see them them doing well this season. So that would be a real battle between the two of them. And Gabriel, I'll let you have the floor for, for League Two. Uh, let's have a look at the League Two fixtures. Which ones are catching uh, your eye this week? Putting you on the spot here a bit, mate. But, uh, well, I'm going to be at Warsaw. <laughs> against Stevenage, which uh, I'm really excited for that one because I did watch Warsaw against Scunthorpe and I did really, uh, Matthew Taylor's side did really impress me, especially in the first half of that one. So I'm hoping the Saddlers can uh, can repeat uh, some of those passages of play against the Stevenage side that have shown some uh, sh- some shi- signs of, uh, of playoff potential. But Leighton Orient against Bradford looks a big one. In my opinion, Bradford City and Forest Green could be the two standout sides in League Two this season. Yes. And yeah, last one for me, I think Sutton, Sutton Oldham is a really big one down the bottom there. We're talking about newly promoted teams we're trying to get off to a good start for Sutton. I think people thought they would maybe get a few more points than the, they have at this moment in time, but that's a massive opportunity for them to, to go and get a victory against bottom placed Oldham. But time will tell. Guys, we want you to call it before these games happen. Let us know in the comments below bits and pieces that you think are going to happen. Gut feels. Have you, have you looked into the stats? Have you seen it in the stars? Whatever it may be, we, we want to know what you think is going to happen this weekend in all of the big games that we've discussed or whoever your team is. We want to know about your team because, of course, you can always add value to the show every week by letting us know how your team's doing because, they, of course, there are so many teams in the division and we can't talk about all of them every single week. But don't worry, we will always get to every single team during the season, which is a great reason, of course, to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell. That's a really important part of it, guys, because when that happens, you will get a notification that suggests, uh, that tells you that we're, we're going live. Gabriel, thank you so much, my friend. It's lovely to chat to you as ever. Uh, have a great weekend. Enjoy the Walsall game, and I'm sure we'll, we'll chat very, very soon. Cheers, James. 
Cheers, pal. Uh, Gabriel Sutton, of course, is on Twitter. Search that name if you want top quality uh, EFL tweets and content. So that's it for another God, jam-packed show. Um, of course, my name has been James Alcott. Uh, make sure you tweet me anything interesting from the weekend. We can put it in only in the EFL. Massive thank you to all of our guests. And of course, you guys joining us live. Go and check out all that other content on League of 72, that full interview with Liam Rossinia and the top 10 goals. And there's a whole host of other bits and pieces. Go and have a little look. I reckon you'll find something that you'll enjoy. We'll see you again next week, Thursday, 4 p.m. only on the League of 72 channel. We'll see you then.